one of the keys to being successful in sales is identifying your target audience, the people who actually need the services or the product that you sell, and then also understanding the pains that they have and why they want to buy your product or your service, and then simply being persistent. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. And on this show, we bring you ideas and insights from construction leaders and construction geniuses. That's right. Every single week from across the country to help you lead more effectively. This episode is brought to you by Paradigm Estimate, a technology-driven takeoff service that gives you the speed accuracy, and consistency it takes to win more bids. Spend less time on tedious takeoffs and more time on what counts the most growing your business. Check out Paradigm Estimate at myparadigm.com slash Bradley. That's right, my own name right there at the end of the URL. That is myparadigm, M-Y-P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M.com slash Bradley. Now, today we have a special guest on our show. His name is Eric Anderton, and you might be familiar with him. He hosts a wonderful podcast that I listen to often called Construction Genius. That's right. He's not afraid. Not afraid. Humility. Not afraid of it. Let's just throw it out there. It's our little genius, right? So he has the podcast called Construction Genius, and he has on some wonderful guests talking about all sorts of different aspects of the construction industry. And he's been an executive coach for over a decade. And you can tell that by the guests that he has on his show. Also very smart. So if you're not subscribed to that and listening to it, Construction Genius, I would recommend you do that. He recently came out with a book called, you got it, Construction Genius. And this is one of these books that is really valuable for anyone in the construction industry because it covers a whole host of topics that you are going to encounter, if not now, certainly in the future. It's more of a reference book that you can come back to for different challenges that you might be facing internally with your own people and growth or externally with customers or just about anything. So he covers an awful lot of territory in the book, Construction Genius. You can buy it on Amazon. So if you're in the construction industry, you're a builder of some sort, you're going to get value from it. Also, if you're in sales, you're going to hear me say this in the podcast. This is a wonderful gift. I would recommend buying 10, 25, 50, 100, whatever. A book is a really cheap way to deliver a ton of value for the people that you care about. So listen to this episode with me, the construction genius himself, Mr. Eric Anderton. And if you got value from it, follow up, make an investment, share it with your network and see what happens. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mr. Eric Anderton. As always, thank you for listening. Mr. Eric Anderton, welcome to the show. Bradley, thank you for having me. This is a joy because I've been looking at your face with hair, without hair, for a long time, as I've been a fan of your podcast and learned a lot, just uh, not only from your content and your guests, but also how you went about doing that. So I'm excited to have you. Thank you for making time. It's my privilege and uh, thank you for your kind words. Sure. So let's start here, Eric. Let's go in the way back machine. You're 12 years old. If you can, maybe geographically place us where you are, maybe give us a little context about maybe your family life, and maybe what you were passionate about at that time. (laughs) I'm 12 years old. I'm living in Bristol, England. I'm living with my dad. I was actually originally born in Bristol. I'm I'm English. I had spent much of my first 10 years or so moving around Europe and the United States with my mom, but then I moved back with my dad when I was 10, lived with him for a few years. So I'm going to what's called a public school in England, which is actually a private school. 
So it was kind of like a, a mid-tier private school. I was not doing very well academically because I was not a very good student. Played some rugby, enjoyed playing rugby, and listened to a lot of punk music. That was in the 80s. <laughs> That's when all of that absolutely blew up. Well, so tell me, I just assumed you were just very articulate and very well-spoken, and I find my Chicago roots often have me listening to my own podcast. And I'm like, why is he talking so fast? So maybe give us a little context. What did your family do? How did you end up there? And wh why did you ultimately come over here to the US? Yeah, so like I said, my, my parents were divorced when I was young. My dad always lived in England. My mom moved around uh, Europe and ended up in America, in California. And so when I was 15, I moved back to live with my mom. So I finished high school in the United States, went to college. From there, just started my career here in Northern California. Got it. As you look back on that and think about your leadership journey, are there any sort of principles that came about during your childhood about moving around, seeing different cultures and what was similar and what was different to be able to kind of bring that with you? It's funny. I, I've, I haven't reflected too much on that other than I am comfortable meeting people that I don't know. And I'm not necessarily an extrovert, but, but I'm comfortable meeting people I don't know. I'm comfortable with different cultures. And I think I'm, generally speaking, more interested in other people than I am myself. You can tell I'm a, a little uncomfortable talking about myself because I, I actually find people more interesting. That's why I like doing my own podcast and interviewing them, because I find that every person, every company has a, a, a unique story, though they share some similarities in terms of the issues that they, they face because they're full, full of people and people are the same from culture to culture. Each one is unique and that uniqueness is what attracts me to it and interests me. Well, I think that has shown through in your book in that there is, number one, just the range of business issues and challenges that have been around for a long time. You address in a way that I feel like you're one of us and it's just, it's an easy thing to read. And we're going to hit on some of the frameworks that you described in there. And I think for my own business as we're growing there are some things just in terms of overall leadership and communication. I'm going to ask you about the EAR, e -A -R framework here in a minute that I just immediately was able to grasp and use. And I think that those are so valuable, but they're often hard to find. So somewhere in all your experiences there, I think provide a ton of value to the readers of your book. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe let's start here. So you graduate college, you start with Copiers Plus, and on your LinkedIn bio, you said you started listening to tapes with Zig Ziglar. And I think what also separates you from other folks that I've read who are experts in the construction industry is you do have a way of making sales and marketing relative to the construction industry easy, which I think a lot of people really struggle with. So maybe, maybe tell us just a little bit about that journey and what you learned and what you took away from that first job in sales. So I was living up in Humboldt County, which is in Northern California, famous for redwoods and marijuana. I was actually involved in a uh, campus ministry, and I was teaching a Bible study up there. And so I wanted to have some freedom as far as my schedule. So that's why I got into sales. And I went to work for this very small copier company. I went to work for them because I really liked the guy. And I didn't know anything about sales other than, you know, I was willing to go make cold calls and all that kind of stuff. And so I was listening to Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins and all of those classic sales guys just kind of cutting my teeth and going through the pain of learning how to sell things and learning how to build relationships with people. And I think that really stood me in good stead because I understood that one of the keys to being successful in sales is identifying your target audience, the people who actually need the services or the product that you sell, and then also understanding the pains that they have and why they want to buy your product or your service, and then simply being persistent and always showing up never giving up. Because if you combine an understanding of your audience with a sense of persistence when it comes to sales, then you will be successful. Yeah. And I think this is a good segue into something I'll tee up for you, an experience that maybe this real person's name is Dan, or maybe Dan is an amalgamation of other people, but we're going to get into it. Well, in sales, they often talk a lot about really understanding your value and how much your time is worth and way too many salespeople, and you're going to share some stories about construction folks who think, well, yeah, here's my, my salary, and I guess I could figure out an hourly rate. Or other people are like, well, you know, it's kind of variable, so I have no hourly rate. 
which is not right. So you talk about this idea of an aspirational hourly rate and how you challenged one of your clients to really embrace the fact that he should be charging $833 an hour. And for some of the folks listening to this right now, the idea that someone's time would be worth $833 is probably unimaginable. So maybe go into that, that kind of the principle and how you coach people to think that way. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because it's funny. I was just having a conversation with one of my clients this this week who's an executive in a construction company. And, and basically what we were doing is we were taking his salary and we were then putting in all the benefits and we divided that by the hours that he worked. And I was encouraging him that if you're doing any tasks that fall below that salary amount, and for him, it was a little lower than 800 bucks. He's not the CEO of the company, but if it falls below that, then you need to delegate it. So if this is like a, if your salary and your benefits and everything come together with your bonuses and you're maybe getting 200 bucks an hour, if you're doing a $50 an hour task, you know right away, this is something I need to delegate to other people. And then when I'm working with the CEOs of companies, because particularly as your company grows, your time becomes more and more valuable. In my mind, you should set an aspirational hourly rate that goes beyond even what you're making with your salary. And the reason why is because that immediately begins to filter the activities that you're doing, and it gives you a simple framework that you can use to understand what you need to either delete or delegate to other people. Because you cannot waste your time doing things that are not in alignment with that aspirational hourly rate. And if you begin to discipline yourself that way and filter all of the things that you do through that framework, it will completely change the way that you spend your time. How might you coach someone who's listening and saying, all right, Eric, Bradley, I hear what you're saying, but here's the deal. This activity, it's really important and my expectations for excellence to do what we do, it has to be done right and only I can do it. And if I have to train someone else, by the time I get done training them, it's not even worth it. I'll just do it myself. How might you get these individuals, because there are many listening for sure, who are thinking along those lines? So if you're thinking along those lines, you just, you have to understand that you are limiting yourself. Now you are correct, more than likely, that other people cannot do it as well as you. But let me ask you this question. Who decides what's acceptable? And at the end of the day, who decides what's acceptable or good enough is your customer. And if the person that you employ is able to accomplish the task in a manner that is acceptable to the customer, even if it's not at the level of quality that you can deliver that task, then that is good enough. And I'm not trying to get you to lower your standards in any way. I'm just asking you to set your standards realistically. And if you do not delegate tasks to other people, and if you do not take the time to train them to do them acceptably, then you will never be able to grow your business. And you will always be frustrated, not only by the performance of other people, but by the fact that your time is taken doing things that you know other people should be doing. Yeah. Well, I have a ridiculous example that's very personal. For a while, I wanted excellence in everything we did, including invoicing. And each one was like a special little piece of art and I would put their logo and I chose the font and I would do all of this. And I had a coach of my own, similar to you saying, who really decides that? And I said, you know what? I'm going to call someone who's very design oriented. And I called him up. I said, hey, do you get value from the little things we do in the invoice? And he said, I don't even look at the invoice. It goes directly to Carol and she handles it. And it was like a two by four across the forehead. But I think exactly what you're talking about, and maybe the invoice example doesn't resonate with our listeners, but a lot of people are doing something very similar in their own business. So that's what you want to do, that invoice example. And the silly analogy that I use many times is what I call the hot dog analogy. So if if you're a star hitter, you're on a baseball team, and you're in the batter's box, And the owner of the baseball team is yelling at you from the stands, asking you to come into the stands and sell hot dogs. That would be absolutely insane. But the problem with a lot of construction leaders is that they're hot dog vendors, not star hitters. They spend their time selling hot dogs instead of staying in that batter's box and hitting a home run. Yeah. I'm a big fan of a guy named Steven Pressfield, who's a writer and 
he wrote a blog post about Frank Sinatra doesn't move the piano, you know, and that same idea of individual tasks. And I was at the doctor this week. I went through three different nurses before I got to the doctor and the doctor was there for like eight minutes. And so I think these things are all around us, but until you put on a lens where you see how other industries are doing what is very standard and acceptable, sometimes we struggle with that. Yep. So again, ask yourself, the aspirational hourly rate is a very good filter that to use. The other one is the hot dog vendor analogy or the invoice. I really like the invoice one as well, because some of us, you know, we obsess over things because that's just the way we are and we think they're important and they, they're absolutely not. So if you can clearly answer, what does my client, the one who actually gives me money, what do they say is good enough? I'm going to hit that and be satisfied with that. Yeah, absolutely. You talk about this, I am currently, and we, my team, are currently in a state that is somewhat challenged by this. I literally have a sign up here, you can't see it. It says, no is a complete sentence. Yes. For the better part of the last three or four years, I have been, I don't want to say completely unsuccessful, but relatively unsuccessful in really changing my behavior to do kind of what we're talking about on just a significantly smaller scale. As you are coaching your clients, you're saying, listen, if you want to grow at the rate that you want to, that you're capable of the classic line, you know, what got you here won't get you there. You got to start saying no to stuff. But for me, as the owner of our business, it all looks like helping people. It all looks like fun. And we don't have systems where people aren't cutting me off ahead of time. For folks that are listening that are also struggling with that, how do you help? Um, you must define your role and responsibility. And like you said, what got you here will not get you there. The reason why many construction leaders and construction company owners are where they are is because they always say yes. But at a certain point, those yeses, again, what they do is they take you away to tasks that either other people should be doing or that you shouldn't be doing at all. And so you, you have to give yourself permission not to be a people pleaser. And simply to be able to say no in a very clear way, understanding that that no, what it does is it frees you up to focus on the highest and best use of your time. And if you are focused on the highest and best use of your time, that's when you're going to have the largest positive impact on your clients and your employees. So that no is actually a gateway to yeses. Yeses to spending your time well. But you have to be willing to go through the pain of saying no so that you can then get to that yes. I felt guilty. I feel bad. Yesterday, a friend who I very much like, I admire, was writing a blog post and he said, hey, really interested to get your thought on this. Can you just give me a little blurb? I can add it in there and promote you. <laughs> this is the sort of thing I would always say yes to. And I was like, I'm behind on my own book writing, my own blog post. And I stared at it. And then my first compromise was, well, when you're done writing it, send it to me. I'll see if anything jogs my memory. And then my assistant says, what are you doing? Why? And he said, listen, if you don't have it by the end of the day, Friday, we're just going to move on. No worries. This was a painful reaction for me. And I'm not good at this, but I was like, all right, that was a small victory. But you can imagine though, if I'm struggling with something like that, there are much larger, significant hurdles that I also need to work through as well. Yeah. And so again, define your role and responsibility. Ask yourself, am I executing that role and responsibility at the highest possible level? If it falls outside of my role and responsibility, if it's below my aspirational hourly rate, if I'm selling hot dogs, all I need to say is no. Mm -hmm. Not hard, not hard. And yet it is. Well, no, I mean, it's simple, but it's yeah, not yes, easy. Yes. It's hard, right? Because you have to go through the pain of saying no. But then if you get into that habit, then it becomes more familiar to you, particularly if, you've, if you haven't previously been very good at saying no. Yeah. It's one of those, I've got a friend who says, reads easy, does hard. And I'm like, yes, there simple, you go. not That's easy. That's a good one. I like that. Let's talk about the EAR framework of leadership. By the way, I'm assuming you call it the EAR, not E-A-R, but go into that for us. I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I always smile because uh, this is actually something I, I came up with myself and it's always a little cheesy, but, it, but if you need to remember... The messages that you as a leader should be communicating to your direct reports every single day, all you have to do is grab your ear. And ear is spelled E-A-R. The E, it stands for encouragement. The A, accountability. And the R, recognition. 
And in my experience of two decades of working with construction companies, what sets apart the best from the also rans is their ability to communicate effectively. It's not technical skills. Most people have the technical skills. They know how to build. What they don't know how to do is how to communicate and how to lead. And so each one of those has a particular message behind it. So encouragement, the message is, you can do it. With accountability, the message is, did you do it? That's the question. With recognition, the R is recognition. You did it. And so encouragement, accountability, recognition, those are the conversations you have to have every single day with the people who report to you. So the way to, to implement the ear framework very simply is to think about the people who report to you and ask, is there someone who needs empowerment in terms of their role and responsibility? Because if I'm going to be able to encourage them and say, you can do it, I must first have trained them to be able to do what I'm asking them to do. I should think about someone who's not performing at the highest possible level, and perhaps I haven't trained them, I haven't empowered them, and so I need to do that so I can then earn the right to look them in the eye and say, you can do it. Because if I've done that, then I've also earned the right to hold them accountable, to have those difficult conversations where I ask them, did you do it? If not, why not? How can I help? That's a conversation that great leaders have to have. And then once I, I've seen them perform at a high level, I've held them accountable, then I recognize them. And one of the, the misses that people have often in recognition is first, they forget to recognize their A players. They see someone who's like a B player perform well, and they immediately get so excited that they recognize them. But my contention is that business is like professional sports, not like rec sports, right? So in rec sports, everyone gets a trophy. In professional sports, only the winners get the trophies. So you need to make an aggressive effort to make sure that you're recognizing your A players. And when you're recognizing your A players, you should first be consistent in doing that. You should not forget them. Then you should be personal to them. And what I mean by that is you should make sure that you are recognizing them in the way that they want to be recognized. Some people, for instance, they don't want to be called up in front of the whole company and given a trophy. They don't like that. They like something more personal and something more tailored to them. And so make sure that when you are recognizing people, you're taking into account how they like to be recognized and make sure that you are personalizing it in such a way that it has an impact on them. That's really well said. I'm wondering how you might help reorient some folks who might be thinking, Eric, I hear you, the ear framework, encourage, accountability, recognition. That's great. The other part of this is I'm hiring these folks. We're paying them six figures. I expect them to do the job. When I was coming up through the ranks, I didn't get my first compliment until I was 22 years in the business, Eric. Why? Why do we have to do this now? I think that's a great point. And first, I would agree with you. Don't give out cheap recognition. Really don't do it. But what my argument is this, is that human beings, they need structure in their lives and they need an affirmation that they're going in the right direction. And so encouragement, accountability, and recognition gives that to them. What you're doing is you're not babying people. Your goal, because you are paying them six figures, is to maximize their performance. And whether you like it or not, the fact is 95% of people benefit from that human interaction that I'm describing through encouragement, accountability, and recognition. There's a few people who don't need that, but most people do. And so if you want to get the return on investment from your time and the money that you're giving them, that idea of accountability and encouragement and recognition is 100% necessary. Yeah. I think you hit on something. I want to make sure we don't gloss over this recognizing A players. And I think it's it's tangential to what I was just describing. Yeah, these guys are awesome. I expect them to do that because they're the most senior, they're, they're the most profitable, they're the most highest paid. And yet, if you want your organization to grow, the next level of growth is probably not going to come from the C player who just became kind of a B minus. It's from the A guys right. who are just have all That's that right. talent. And I don't think that is said often enough. So do you have anything else to reinforce that at all before we move on? Because I think it's, it is powerful. Yeah. So in every company you, you have, let's say you have a group of 10 people and two of them are going to be barrel scrapers. 
you want to be rotating those people out of your company. The mindset that you need is the mindset of a, a general manager of a sports franchise where you're never settling. Okay. So I know that you have projects scheduled, so you can't just fire the C players every day all the time because you, you sometimes you need people on the job site. But if you've got a C player, you're saying, I note that, and I know that I've got to get that position filled with a B or an A player. So I'm never going to settle. I'm always going to be filling my funnel, the top of my funnel of potential employees with candidates. And I know that's a lot of work. So it is a lot of work. And you're going to always have to do that work. The reason why sports franchises go downhill is because their recruiting efforts go downhill as well. They stop being able to identify the talent, bring that talent in and develop it. So if you're in business, you're in the business of talent identity identification and development for the rest of your life. So make sure that you're noting the C players and moving them out. Take a look at those B players, that middle group of six people or so, and think about who they're associating with and how you can identify the key skills or behaviors that they need to change in order to improve their performance. And if you can give them the right support with that encouragement, accountability, and recognition, then they can aspire and perhaps attain a player status from time to time at a more consistent level. And so you always want to be evaluating your roster, never settling, and asking this question, do I have the right people in the right seats doing the right jobs. Just making notes here. This is super, super relevant <laughs> for me. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts and how you coach folks. Well, and I think probably most likely, and you can tell me if, I, if I'm wrong, is when you're coaching executives, often it's, yeah, some of changing their behaviors, but also empowering them, making them more confident, enabling them to change the paradigm and change the behavior of their team. What happens if we got an executive who's listening right now and he says, I tell my guys over and over again is their job is to make decisions and yes. they often, because of a fear of failure, of making the wrong decision, they're just kind of delaying it. They're not making it or there's more bureaucratic work when I'm okay with them making a decision and failing, but they're not. How do we change that? Well, the first thing I would say is I would ask the executive, and I might do this through a 360, I, I might actually find out whether or not that executive truly is okay with people failing. Because he or she may be saying, yes, I am okay with people failing, but when someone fails, that, that person gets nailed. Okay, so that's the first thing I would be doing. The second thing I would do is make sure that the executive is clearly defining for the people who report to him or her the role and responsibility that each one of their direct reports has. And then clearly outlines to them the parameters for decision making in terms of dollar amount or the intensity of the decision that they are responsible for. So in other words, you know, let's say you're working on a project and any change order up to $10,000, you can make that decision. If it gets over $10,000, let's have a conversation. And my expectation is that you do not come to me with anything that is uh, less than $10,000 when it comes to a change order. That's just one example. And so if you clearly define those parameters, you paint the picture, this is what I expect you to do, then you can begin to hold them accountable. And when you've clearly defined the parameters and you actually don't blow your lid if they do screw something up that's within their role and response responsibility, then you can begin to work with them when they come back to you and say, well, what about this? What about that? You can, again, remind them, now that's within your role and responsibility. You make the call. Yeah, I like that. Let's switch a little bit, but I think this is all around improving team performance, changing behaviors. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the adoption of new technology and sometimes the cascading and sometimes unintended consequences that come from that. I don't know about you, but I have been enamored with this chat GPT and its ability to help <laughs> shave hours a week off my time and kind of routine communication and in some cases ideation on certain kind of workshops or speaking opportunities. But that's on the forefront of my mind. But just technology adoption in the construction industry, there are pockets of high achievers and early adopters. My experience has kind of shown there's an awful lot of folks that are still buying new fax machines. And maybe for folks that are struggling with that in our audience, how might you go about talking to them about that topic? So when it comes to adopting new technology, one of the problems construction companies have is right now it's a very hot space. And so you have 
a whole bunch of different people coming out of the woodwork with their technology pitches to you. And you've got to filter through those and see which ones you might actually want to implement. So in my experience, talking with many people who go through technology adoptions and implementations and who actually sell them, I think in construction specifically, you have to keep in mind where do you make your money and where you make your money is in the field. If you're going to bring in a piece of technology that impacts the field, you actually have to start in the field with a conversation with the folks who will be using the technology. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they make the decision about whether or not new technology is adopted ultimately. But if you want that technology to be adopted successfully, you do need to get the buy-in of the field if it's something that's going to impact them. So the way that you do that is is you go to someone in the field who is open to new technologies and open to the discussion, and you ask them, what is the biggest problem that you have in terms of building your projects profitably? And let them tell you what that big problem is. And then ask yourself the question, is there a technology that can actually solve that problem? You know, so if I give all of my guys iPads in the field, will that give them an opportunity to report their time more efficiently? And as a result of that, I can track it and and be more profitable. That's just one very simple example. The point is, if you don't have buy-in, you can drive all of this change from the top of your organization. But if you don't have the buy-in all throughout your organization, then there's going to be resistance to the adoption of the technology. If they don't see the why, if they don't understand how this helps to save time or to save money or to increase safety or to make things easier. If they don't understand that why, then they won't adopt it. So you have to be able to clearly understand the business case behind the adoption of technology and then be able to get the buy-in of the people who will be using the technology. And then what I would say is that when you do begin to implement technology, start small, start localized, you know, start with one project, get some wins under your belt. Don't bring in this entire system and and expect everyone to adopt it right away and for it to transform your company. Okay. Start small, get some wins, build a case, and then go from there. um, Learning as you go, iterating in the use of the technology so that you get the maximum benefit from it. This might be a Terrible question. And if it is, Eric, just tell me. You're a person who specializes in asking good questions. <laughs> Some of the challenges we see with our clients is when, and maybe it's new technology, or it could just fall under the general category of change management. Despite being in construction where we continuously find ourselves over budget, behind schedule on little projects or larger projects internally, I feel like we do the same thing. We talk about just what's a reasonable time frame for this. So here's the maybe terrible question. What's your advice for leaders? We're talking very broadly on change management on how to really think about what is a reasonable time frame so we don't feel this pressure either overcommit or also just jam new things down people's throats. In terms of a technology adoption, depending on the scale of it, I would say six to 12 months at least. If it's something that spans the entire execution of a project, then you have to take into account your typical project timeline. So if, I mean, if you're a large GC and you're doing two-year projects, for instance, then you may have to make that longer. It depends on the, the scale of the implementation and the scale of the project that it's being implemented into. Yeah, no, that's right. In your book, you describe kind of the seven attributes of some of the best construction leaders that you've been around and that you help coach. Number three struck me for a couple different reasons, but it's they work with project partners they trust. And supply chain issues, commodity pricing volatility, the pandemic, there was a lot of really strong relationships over the last couple of years that have gone strained. And you would say there was trust there, maybe a high amount of trust And that's gone. And that has led to new relationships with different people. And I'll often ask where we're kind of identifying risk and the opportunity and what this year looks like and how we're going to help really guide the organization. I'll say this is kind of a real linchpin here. To what degree do you trust Eric or Bradley or whatever? And sometimes the answer is it's too early to tell. I don't really know. How do you help people think about developing trust in situations where we're kind of new to each other and we're feeling each other out and we really haven't gone through a gauntlet or two to really understand how we behave in those moments. And I think you really hit on it there, Bradley, because the the only way to build trust is through time and through difficulties. One of the quickest ways to violate trust is when a difficulty comes up and you don't tell the truth about the difficulty, right, or the challenge. So, you know, if you're working with a project, you're a sub, let's say, and you screw something up, 
if you're straight up with the GC, because I promise you, good help is hard to find. So the GC is always looking for subs who, who are good help. And if the GC is smart, I'm assuming they are, they know that mistakes get made. And if you're able to own up to those mistakes and fix it as quickly as possible, instead of pointing the finger to another sub or to the GC, then that will help to build trust. And so trust takes time and trust is something that can be violated very quickly, but it is built through conflict and difficulty and challenge. And so if you want to build trust in a relationship with a, your project partners, one of the best ways to do that is to tell the truth about what's going on on a project. And if you make a mistake, raise your hand, own that mistake as quickly as possible. Because one of the mistakes that we make in life is we allow time to pass when an issue comes up. And the more time passes, the more pain increases. So if you want more pain and if you want to lose more money, just let an issue come up and allow time to pass and you will get more pain and you will lose more money. Just let it fester. That's a surefire way to increase pain and lose money. Eric, are there some maybe non-obvious ways that our audience can engineer situations to develop more trust early on in that relationship. Despite what you said is at a certain point, we just gotta, we gotta live together. We gotta work together and we gotta build trust that way. And that's how it works for humans. However, maybe at the early stages, there are some smart things you can do that maybe are underutilized tactics to develop trust a little bit faster. I think one of the quickest ways to do it from a positive perspective is to be responsive. So if someone sends you a request and you have established the parameter that I'm going to respond to this request within you know X number of hours, then do so. And so be a person of your word. One thing that I think you need to do right away is if you have project meetings every week to review where the project's at and, and how things are going, you need to attend those meetings and you need to be on time and you need to have your act together. So don't show up at those projects not having your information, not being ready to answer the questions. So beyond even before any mistakes or drama or issue comes up, if you're simply consistently showing up on time and if you're responsive to the request for information, that's immediately going to develop that foundation of trust that you can then draw upon in the future when issues do arise. Yeah, that's helpful. I want to make sure we hit on strategy, kind of on why you say, hey, let's, why strategy second? Because I often find the term strategy or strategic is easy just to kind of throw around and kind of makes people feel smarter. Yet, I think a lot gets lost into what that actually means in terms of behaviors on the job. So maybe go into that a little bit about the general idea and the concept of strategy in terms of your book. The idea behind strategy is very simple. It's I'm asking and answering the question, how are we going to be successful? And when it comes to a business, success is determined by not just the money that I bring in at the top line. It's determined by my bottom line, the profit that I generate. And it's also determined by my ability to retain great employees and great clients and to be building the types of projects that are in my wheelhouse. And so when I'm putting together a strategy, there's three legs that a strategy for a construction company sits upon. And obviously, there's a lot of detail behind each one of these. But nevertheless, it is on a broad basis, pretty simple. And that is right client, right project, right location. And so I have to be able to, de to determine and to be able to clearly articulate, this is the type of work that we do. These are the types of clients that we build for. And this is the location that we work in. And if I can dial in all three of those together, then I can be pretty sure that I'm going to be able to build profitably and consistently. One of the mistakes that construction companies make is they take on the wrong clients and the wrong projects in the wrong locations. Or let's say of those three things, they have just one of them. So they have the right client right? But the client's asking them to go do a job that's outside of their geography. And it's maybe a little bit out of their wheelhouse, but they want to say yes to the client. So they take it on, they underperform and they ruin the relationship. So when you're putting together your strategy, keep it as simple as you can, right client, right project, right location. I love that. I also feel like if I gave you just a little bit more detail before this call, this would be 100% applicable to us and our business right now. As you think about that right client, right project, right location, is one of those more likely to be violated first than others? Or are they all the issues that you see where you say, well, we only have two legs of the stool. No wonder it fell over. 
Does one pop up more than others? That's a good question. One that does occur is I, I actually have the, the right project from a technical perspective. I know how to build it. But let's say I'm, I'm a subcontractor and the typical size job that I'm doing is, let's say it's a million bucks. And then a GC comes along and says, look, this is in your wheelhouse, but it's a larger project. It's like a million five or two million. So I have all the resources and the know-how to build the million dollar project. And I have the know-how to build the $2 million project, but I don't have the resources, the manpower. So I'm going from, let's say, two crews or three crews to four crews. And so now on the job, I've got not only do I have my A players, but you know what? I've got the C crew on there as well. And that affects the profitability. And so it's kind of a subtle one there as well. I not only have to know the right project from a technical perspective, but also from a size perspective relative to my available labor pool so that I'm able to execute profitably. Yeah. Yeah. That's so well said. So I'm going to two questions here to kind of close this out here. I'm just curious about your own development as a business owner, as a business leader, are there any books or any other sort of media, whether it's a movie or a podcast or anything in your career development that you look back and say, these are some other ideas that other people lived and put on paper or shared with me that really changed to some degree, large or small, the trajectory of my own career? Sure. I'll give you a couple. The first one is The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. It's a very slim little book. Peter Drucker, he, if you don't, haven't heard his name, he wrote in the, you know, he, he was active from, let's say, the 50s through the early 2000s. And every single person who has written a business book in the United States in the last 50 years is standing on his shoulders, every single person. And so you want to go to the source the source is The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker, particularly for leaders of construction companies. Read that book. It's brilliant. The other one, and I'll tell you a funny story. When I started my business in 2013, I walked in on one of my clients from a previous business that I was in, and he said, Eric, we were just talking about you. And he held up a book, and he said, we've been reading this book, and will you do a workshop for us on this book? And I'd never read the book before, but of course I said, yes, I'll do it. And the book was The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Pat Lencioni. That was an extremely impactful book in my career. When I started my own business in 2013, a lot of the work that I did, particularly initially, was around that framework of the five dysfunctions of a team. And so that book, and then his other book called The Advantage, which articulates a very clear and simple way to put together a plan for your business are both excellent books and ones that I would highly recommend. Love that. So I've, the advantage a client gave to me and is on my, should have already read, but haven't. The effective executive, I kind of went out and looked for a first edition. It's cloth covered, but I couldn't agree more. And there are some individuals where you're like, I've never even heard of this guy. Like, who is Theodore Vail with AT&T from the early 19th century? He's quoting some of these guys that are worth investing in, finding out who they are. But it's crazy how timeless those principles are. And I, that my guess is that was probably written somewhere in the, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, they're awesome. They're awesome. I, I highly, highly recommend it. The, the thing that you got to understand, the, the reason why you want to go back in time when you're reading these books around people is because people don't change, right? We know that. That's why when we read a book that's thousands of years old and we're like, dude, that's just like me. It's because people don't change. So think about those deep works that have been around for a while because those are the ones that'll, because a lot of business books, and this is one thing I don't like about business books is they take like one idea right? One good idea, let's say, and then they expand it over 120 pages. And you're like, dude, you have one good idea. This could be a blog post. With Peter Drucker, that is not the case. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a good transition. We're talking about books, how to deliver value within books. Make it really obvious because I thoroughly enjoyed your book. And I also feel like reading your book is a reference book of of sorts, which is it's around, I am not going through right now a recruiting and hiring challenge, but I will be in probably six months. And you hit on these topics, you're concise and you move all the way through so many different aspects of it. Maybe as we close out here, number one, I want to make it super obvious where people can find it, but also maybe just go in a little bit more of what you were just talking about when you recognize where you got immense value 
and other books where you didn't and how that influenced how you wrote Construction Genius? I think the key is, is that when you're writing a book, it helps to have a target audience in mind. And my audience is very clear. It's construction company owners and leaders. And so I know because I've worked with them for 20 years, the issues that they have, I know what works, what doesn't work, and how most construction leaders value and embrace a simple, direct approach. And so that's what I've attempted to put into the book, and specifically around the main issues of leadership, strategy, sales, and marketing. What's really cool, I actually have a copy right here. You can go out to Amazon. Let me tell you about the subtitle of the book, because it's Effective, Hands-On, Practical, Simple, No BS, Leadership, Strategy, Sales, and Marketing Advice for Construction Companies. And I always laugh a little bit when I read that, but let me tell you where I got that subtitle from. I got it from one of my clients. And it was what one of my clients said about the training that I do. It's effective, hands-on, practical, simple, and no BS. And so if that's something that you search for and you want it specifically for a construction company, you're in a construction company, then just go out to Amazon. You can search the book up. You can read all the reviews. We're getting some killer reviews. And you can get it on Kindle or you can get it on paperback or Audible. I, I narrated the Audible myself. And, you know, it's a tremendous book that, that I think I know actually will have a great impact. And let me give you actually another example. There's this very large general contractor in Southern California. The CEO of the company, he bought a book for himself and for all of his leaders. And they then had a book club. What they did is they would meet once a month for a quarter and they would cover four chapters in the book. And basically, they'd ask the questions, what did you learn? What did you notice? What would you do differently? And they would discuss the book. And that was one way to take the, the principles and implement them in your organization. So that would be a great thing is to actually go out and purchase copies for not only yourself, but also for the leaders in your company, because they'll get tremendous benefit. I will take that one step further. There are many folks who are listening right now who are partners or suppliers two builders who are living in this. And I will say, this is the book where buy 50 copies, buy a hundred copies for the team and say, listen, I listened to a podcast. This is what someone does for a living. He distilled 20 years worth of advice and proven value they've delivered to help people just like you. Somewhere in here, there's going to be something that is extremely relevant. And I think that number one, it's easy. It's a very I mean, for the value you can get, it's extremely economical. It'll come right to your door. And again, I think that's where going back to trust and relationships, it's the sharing of insights and saying, I'm out here looking for ways to make you successful. You know, Mr. Builder, here's something I think will, even if they're not big readers, books are going to stick around and people like books. They never end up in the, you know, the circular file, so to speak. So Whenever I send a proposal to someone who I'm talking to about working with in terms of my services, you know, coaching and or leadership development, I, I always include in the proposal, my expectation is that you would get a five to 10 times return from any money that you invest with me. And if you don't think that's possible, then we should not work together. And so the book, and let me put it in context of the book, the, the paperback is 20 bucks, right? So if you think about a, a 10 times return on 20 bucks, that's $200. I promise you, if you just read one chapter from this book and implemented one idea, you would get a 10 times return on that 20 bucks right away. I know that you would. And so if you're looking for that kind of ROI specifically in a construction company, I know that you'll find it in the book. I agree. Awesome. Eric, I've learned a lot. You've been very generous with your own thoughts and experiences also, you, you have great guests on, and I've learned a lot from them as well. So I would strongly encourage, if you have not purchased the book already, do that. If you work with other builders, buy 50, buy 100 copies, hand them out to everybody. You're going to get value from that. And the easiest way, it's free, right? Go listen to your podcast, subscribe to that. My only hope is, and why I wanted you to have you on the show, is that our audience could get as much or more value than I have for my own company and for our clients. So with that, I'll just say thank you. My pleasure. And I'd just like to make a special offer to your audience, if I might, Bradley. And that's this. If you purchase 10 or more copies of the book, and then you can email me at eric at constructiongenius.com and then put in the, in the subject line, Bradley book, because then I'll know it's from this podcast episode. If you purchase 10 or more copies, then what I'll do is I will come on with your executive team and do a complimentary 30-minute session with the team 
on a topic that will help them to improve as leaders. And I would normally charge $2,000 for that 30 minutes, and I'll do it at no charge if you purchase 10 or more copies of the book. Beautiful. We'll add that to the show notes as well, along with your email and that offer. So that's generous. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. All right, then, friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Mr. Eric Anderton. This episode is brought to you by Paradigm Estimate, a technology-driven takeoff service that gives you the speed, accuracy, and consistency it takes to win more bids. Spend less time on tedious takeoffs and more time on what counts the most, growing your business. Check out Paradigm Estimate at myparadigm.com slash Bradley. And if you got value from this episode, please review us on whatever podcast player you are listening to. Those mean more to us than you know. And if you're not following us on YouTube, you will want to do that. Why? Because the giving never ends. We invest the time and the money to record these conversations I have with people like Eric, and then we slice and dice them put them into smaller segments, put them on YouTube. Why? To make them easier to share, to take the insights that are shared from smart people who have earned these little pieces of wisdom that can have a huge impact to make it easier for you to share them with your team and run a better business to become better leaders. So go to YouTube, subscribe, Bradley Hartman and co. All right, friends, that's all I got. I'm done. We're gonna close out with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week. 